What's up guys? Welcome here. Today we are going to give you guys a little bit of a tour of the garden with Whedon. Just show you guys how we're prepping for the next season. Right now it's the middle of winter. It's the 5th of July. There's no plants in the field. It's looking a little bit scruffy and stuff. But this is the real heart of it. You know, this is when you see what really goes down during the off times. And then this is when you get, the, get to do the important stuff like replenishing your soil, working on all the irrigation systems, fixing everything up again, ready for the next season. So the first thing we're gonna need in order to accomplish our summer grow is the grow space. So today we'll be taking a tour through the garden with Whedon with Aris, and he'll be showing us all the ins and outs of the, the yeah. grow space here, what we need to create an ideal environment for these plants. Cool, come with yeah. me. First of all, when it comes to spacing, is we've got a we're in the southern hemisphere here, yeah? so we've got a we're looking for a north-facing slope, which this is. The sun basically travels across like that. There's a direct relationship between the amount of light they get and the amount of bud they produce. Spacing, what we've done here is every 1.7 meters we've got another plant and we've staggered every second row. So what that does is as the sun goes across, this one doesn't really block that one or that one or that one and on and on and on. So the staggering really works. 1.7, that can vary, that can change depending on the size of the plant that you want. We generally don't go for massive plants. We go for quite small, manageable plants, like just about this size. Some of them might go a bit bigger, but I mean, this is normally what we aim for. So 1.7 is more than enough. Okay. okay, so why would you plant it in a tire as opposed to like a pot? What are the benefits of a tire? The first benefit is they're very easy to come by. Mm -hmm. and they last forever okay. so it's a cheap it's a, it's a very cost effective way to have raised beds eco style puppy eco style plus you know it's a hazard for for nature i mean most of these come out of forest areas that the guys just go and collect for us okay and uh it's just a hazard you know the tire never breaks down okay like this that works for us we want them to never break down Okay. I mean, anyone can get their hands on tires. You can go to like a local tire shop and just ask them for all broken tires. Cleaning up the surrounding areas we've also gotten a lot from. Okay. Uh, a couple of other advantages that the tire has is it's connected to the ground. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot of like mold problems or root rot problems like that because the excess water can escape. Okay. Then every, every tire here at the bottom ring holds a little bit of water every time it rains so you don't have to water nearly as much when we come with a wheat eater and we want to mow the lawn a bit we want to clean up we can go right up against it and just okay so security is a big thing yeah like uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valuable crop and people do come after it. What we've got here is we've got the outer border fence of the farm mm -hmm. and then which goes right around, right around the whole premises. Then we've built this inner layer, so it's a double fence, which we've electrified and the energizers inside here, it's got 10,000 volts. And the nice thing with it is also if someone cuts the line or something like that, the alarm goes off. That's helped us a lot with security, you know, and uh, just to have control over the field, who comes in and out. It's a super important thing. You don't just want people to come in and out. Because it's such an exciting thing and everyone wants to see it, people generally overstep their boundaries. You 
know. <laughs> so if you were to want to build a field like this, I mean a fence like this in your own grow, what materials would you need to? Well, we've, we've basically just used any poles that we could find, which actually came to our detriment because some of them are rotting. But ideally, you just want to get uh, like a good treated poles, plant them every six meters apart from each other, and then you have thinner ones that just stand from the ground up and the wire just keeps it up. You do need quite a bit of fencing wire and stuff like that. I mean, this is a 50 by 50 by 50 by 50. And you can imagine we've got seven or eight layers. So you can say it's about a kilometer of wire that you're gonna need just to do one like this. Excluding electrical fencing and stuff like that. we need but it's always good to have a little bit excess and you can see how that's just oxygenating the, the tank so it's good to run it like this as well every now and then and uh, yeah it just helps to have healthy water <laughs> don't worry don't worry wouldn't be the first time <laughs> so why did you know where they took my ipad to we've got the main reservoir which we just use for water this little one is a feeding tank. This is a 500 litre tank. So we'll just fill this up with food, feed them, and then flush the system again with fresh water after every feeding, basically. The rest of the time, they just get clean water. They don't get fed every time. Like eight out of 10 feedings would be just water and two of them would be a feeding. filter just make sure everything's closed off super effective easy to come by and then you only have to clean this thing every now and then so that keeps all your shit out there this is a fine fine mesh mm -hmm. and it pushes the water in through the middle and out through this thing okay and then it collects the water around the outside and it goes onwards again now this thing just fits inside there like that. Like that. Okay. And easy peasy. This is now a noob question, eh? But when you get the pump and is the filter and the pipes all that separate from the pump? Yeah. Okay. Now every little piece you have to individually go look for and source and they fit together. Okay. It's um it's not that hard, it's like building Legos. <laughs> like you, have to, you have to plan it nicely to have all the, all the little things. <laughs> and then this is the pump that drives the whole system. So this is basically like the heart of the, of the operation. Okay. Uh -huh. And how it works is from the big tank or from this tank, depending on which valve you got open, goes to the pump then we've got a line going up there it goes all the way around the whole field and it goes all the way around 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 around, around. somewhere around here it comes back and this this, this valve that you see sticking out here it comes back and it creates an overflow all the way in back to the tank which makes it really nice because now we can regulate how much pressure we want on the on the drippers. So with drippers it's important to have above a bar of pressure and then the more drippers you open up you'll start losing your pressure okay. then Do you just regulate the pressure with the valve? Just with that one valve as well. Okay. So the pump has got, a, has got this pressure controller on it mm -hmm. which means that if the pressure gets too much it'll switch the pump off. But other, other than that it's just that one valve that controls all the pressure in the line. We've got every single one of them have got their own little eight-liter an hour dripper, 
and these drippers are super cool you can open them up clean them if they get blocked you just open them okay. you can place their rubbers inside just have a look there that's what they look like inside and normally they'll have something stuck there or something like that this is like a little filter uh-huh oh, oh. and i've seen how these guys take individual care of each plant and each gets their attention their little one so as the pipe goes around mm -hmm. um, each line like this has got its own valve to switch it off so that's how we can control how many plants are getting water in the field and is it automated this is completely automated so we've got one tiny little timer tiny little timer <laughs> One timer, yeah, that drives the whole system. Yeah, take it a little closer. Okay, so there's our timer. Yeah. The electricity comes in here, then the pump, and there's a stop valve, electric stop valve in there, by the pump. That, um, it's, both of them are connected to that one timer. Okay, so when the timer sends a signal, it opens the valve. Uh-huh, exactly. It's a little bit overgrown. This guy here, this is an electric valve. Mm -hmm. Now what that does is as soon as the pump stops, then it stops the water from just emptying the whole tank into the field. So just running through, just siphoning through the pump, this will cut it off, no more water goes through. So there's a transformer in there that runs this thing. And with the same line that's on that timer, we just come to the transformer and to the pump. So when that timer switches on, it gives power to the transformer and to the pump. This thing opens up and waters the whole field. As soon as it shuts down, the transformer closes this valve and we know we're not losing any water through the field. Ready. Uh, the mix is ready. Five liters everywhere. So, do these uh, geese and chicken help to eat the pests, Saris? Yeah, they help to reset the field. They fertilizing for us as well. I also keep the grass short, you know, the, especially the geese. For real, they like yeah, grass. The grass, it's them that's like trimmed it down like this. And when we plant in here again, then they've like reset all the bugs, they've cleaned out everything. Then we get like maybe three or four months before any infestation will take over again. So they help a lot with pest control? 100%. Not, okay. But you have to have the mix. You have to have duck with chickens and geese. So they all eat little different things. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Like the, the, the runner duck, they eat snails. So the only ones that eat the snails, then chickens can eat little micro bugs that we can't even see with our eyes, but they can get to it. And then the geese eat the grass. Okay. So, yeah. No, man. So, if you, if you don't mind being my test subject. <laughs> this is in fear fact, everybody. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Eh? Okay, this is the, the start of it all, eh? For real? Yeah, that's the goal. You know, for us to make compost in our compost pile it takes months and you have to turn it and you have to do a lot of soil work where in an animal's stomach it's always perfect, it's always right. And I turn it naturally and it comes out perfect. You know, so it's quite cool. So you let your cows um, cock in here too? Or? Of course, okay. of course yes. Yeah, they come and they do all the grass, the lawn mowing for us and they re-fertilize the soil. Plus, that's just the start of so many things because now bugs will be attracted to this. Bugs will lay their eggs in here. Then smaller little predators will come after that. Bigger, bigger, bigger. And it's just the start of a whole cycle, you know. Oh, wow. Uh, so the, the cow and the bull won't um, eat the cannabis leaves? No, 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 they don't eat cannabis at all. They are strictly browsers. So they only, they only eat grass. In the beginning, we were very nervous about that. <laughs> They're like, ah, don't let the cows come close to the ganja plants, but they actually don't damage them at all. 